he did go the next year to Baltimore to Johns Hopkins University. He came seeking strength and guidance to one of the best known of all American medical schools. Humbly he came, for by now he knew that besides art and science, the healer must have a deep, true inner strength. He had been awarded a fellowship at the School of Hygiene and Public Health, and thus at the age of 28, again became a student. It meant going back to the classroom and the laboratory. It meant tiresome hours relearning techniques that he had lost from lack of practice. Was this class in bacteriology the road forward, or was it a retreat to the protection of academic walls? Only time could tell. Mike got some reassurance from the men who worked next to him. Many had come from distant lands, after years of good work among their own peoples, to prepare themselves for public health careers. They too were learning preventive techniques. They too wanted to catch the trouble early, to fight all illness. But that didn't necessarily mean it was interesting work. Calculating the incidence of industrial accidents in the state of Michigan cannot be expected to inspire a recent pediatrician. Yet statistics are an important part of public health work. One great consolation in this period was Mike's return to family life. He had found a furnished room in the home of a telephone mechanic, the first private home he had lived in for more than five years. It was nice to live with real people again, people who weren't either doctors or patients, children he could relax with and not worry about day and night. Here were parents he could face without fear. It was good to talk about politics and the weather for a change. They lived near the school in a poor part of Baltimore. Their house was a little brick building with the typical marble steps, just like the next one and the one after that. Just like the building that housed the Eastern Health District offices and clinic. This modest institution was run jointly by Mike's school and the city health department. The old familiar combination of teaching and doing. The center was headquarters for the visiting nurses of the neighborhood. It provided free x-ray service to help in the nationwide fight against tuberculosis. It ran well baby clinics for the many families who could not afford private medical care. And before the babies were born, their mothers had come to the prenatal clinic for examination and advice. This part of the new schooling made Mike feel at home again. There was nothing academic about going along with a visiting nurse while she made her rounds in the slum streets like those hidden away in so many cities. These were the people who needed medicine the most. Sickness wasn't something that struck them from time to time. They lived with it all their lives. They almost took it for granted. Malaria, tuberculosis, Anemia, trichinosis, scabies, ringworm, pellagra. They didn't know the names, of course, but they knew the aches and pains only too well. Some of Mike's excursions were to pleasanter places. Water supply and purification is another subject in the public health curriculum. And so is epidemic control. The course started with a study of the famous outbreak of cholera in London back in 1854. It was the first epidemic that had been scientifically tracked down street after street by the corpses that had left in its deadly wake. Mike learned to chart the movement of infection, a lesson that proved useful sooner than he expected. For in October, the maps of the Eastern Health District began to bristle with disease. Health officers and epidemiology professors recognized an abnormal increase in diphtheria. Every day, more cases were rushed to the city hospital for contagious diseases. The entire district was threatened, a district where thousands of children were living in overcrowded homes that invited the spread of infection. A call went out for volunteers to help fight the threat of an epidemic. Some of the students at the School of Hygiene and Public Health answered the call. And Mike was among them. To him, diphtheria had a special significance. But this wasn't London in 1854. Something could be done to stop the ride of death this time. Science has learned to make war on epidemics. The 
The meeting in the little district health office was very much like a military staff meeting, where a campaign is planned and strategy is worked out. The mobilization call was posted everywhere. Diphtheria threatens you. Come to the district clinic for your toxoid. The same call went out to the mothers of the neighborhood. It was taken from door to door by the visiting nurses who made sure that the warning was understood. The danger is real to your children. See that they get to the clinic. Mass mailings of the call went out to all the families listed in the health department records. Nurses went back to check on old patients who had families. The call was sent in bulk to schools and churches. It was posted and passed about into every corner of the district. The clarion had sounded. The fight against diphtheria had started. Mass immunization was to be the first big push. The turnout was gratifying. Hundreds of children rounded up by worried parents, teachers and ministers appeared at the district health clinic to get their injections of toxoid. For medicine has a strong defense against the diphtheria bacillus. It uses the poison of the germ itself, weakened of course, to prevent the disease. But it must be used before the real infection has been caught. So this becomes a battle of hypodermic syringes. The more children injected in time, the fewer the cases. Mike worked long hours wielding needles in this battle with his old enemy. His clinical experience too was helpful these troubled days and nights when he worked round the clock. He often used the antitoxin that had once failed him. The difference this time was in not having to use it a couple of days too late. Mike had caught up in the race against time. As soon as he could get home, he took care of the children with whom he lived. They were in special danger because of his own frequent contacts with infection. And if they caught diphtheria because of him, well, the toxoid would prevent that. These shots were special ones in Mike's personal battle. Sure, the needle hurts a little, but nothing like a bad case of diphtheria, Mike knew. And many families in the district now knew it too. As the fall turned into winter, the hospital admissions grew at an ever-increasing rate. Children were brought in suffering with all aspects of the malady. Some had passed the crisis and only required good nursing care and isolation. But others hovered between life and death as toxin and antitoxin struggled for supremacy. Others had needed surgery, for often cutting open the throat is the only way to keep the child from choking to death as a result of swollen membranes that block the air passages.